So thank you all so much for coming to the launch of our report on the impact of COVID-19 on BAME communities. So the plan for this evening is we'll probably go for about an hour and we'll talk through the report. So each author will lead on a section and then there'll be plenty of time for, for questions with the people who helped write it or indeed general discussion. And this report's quite unusual compared to some of ours in that we actually have policy suggestions at the end. So they're divided into short, medium and long term ideas, but things that the party can basically take and lobby for. So concrete actions rather than just questions, which is mm -hmm. what we normally go for. So without further ado, I'd like to, to hand over to Marit, who's very kindly agreed to introduce this report. We've um, been very glad to be interacting with him in his capacity as a member of the London Assembly. And he's been very supportive to many of us, um, younger folks, especially in London, over the years with campaigning and explaining the ropes of labour to us. So without further ado, Mura, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please do take it away. Well, thank you, Ben, for uh, inviting me along. And can I firstly thank you for your daily uh, reports uh, from so, um, Scientists for Labour about the latest research um, during uh, the lock lockdown that we've had as a result of COVID-19. I certainly find them very, very useful. And um, we shouldn't uh, neglect the role of scientists at, uh, in, in involving policy. I personally think the, um, the political classes are made up of too many lawyers and um, um, PR people. And uh, when we have issues like this, permanent issues like this, it's very, very uh, useful to have the invaluable insights of scientists. Um, I don't claim to be a scientist, although I've got a master's, because uh, I don't think economics is a, um, a science, it's a pseudoscience. So those of you with that background and that insight, um, it's uh, very, very welcomed. And I think in this report, it's quite clear uh, that uh, you've uh, done this very clearly in focusing on one of the main issues uh, that we're facing with dealing with COVID-19, the, the horrendous impact it's had on black, black, Asian and minority ethnic communities uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, you've done something actually, which uh, a previous report last week um, didn't manage to do. You've also given us recommendations and I trust uh, the party will take those on board seriously because I think uh, having read your report during the day, um, I think it's uh, substantial and I do look forward to helping um, get um, your perspective on those recommendations through to those that need to know in the party. So um, I think that's probably the best introduction I can give without giving the contents of the report away, Ben. So I, I suggest we introduce the various um, uh, scientists that uh, you've had doing the various parts of the report um, because I think it stands up very well together and it's best coming from um, the, the, the mouths of those who have actually put it together. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much uh, for that and for your kind words. So we've been really glad today to have a, a pretty diverse list of authors, everyone from chemists and epidemiologists to people with expertise in immunology and education. And I think that's one of the, the really great things about Scientist Flavor is we've been able to pull together so many different people with so many different levels and details and, and subjects of expertise to work on this. Uh, I won't necessarily talk, talk you through all of them, but especially to the people who are going to lead on a section and coordinate uh, the presentation today, thank you so much for your time and effort. It really has made it. And we'll, we'll leave out the little bits about Scientist Flavor, um, but if you do want to know more, please just check out our website. So I think the plan is Mohammed is going to do the introduction. So he'll basically talk you through some of the settings for, for this report, both politically and, and socially. But please just, just bear in mind in the aims and the scope, this is obviously a sensitive issue and we've tried to be as scientific but as understanding as possible. So nothing in here should be taken in any way as, as blaming any part of the BAME community for the, the challenges they've faced. And we obviously stand in, in solidarity with those who've experienced discrimination, be that structural or, or direct. So without further ado, um, Mohammed, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that here. If you just let me know when and if you want me to scroll down and, and let's get started. No, thank you, Ben. No, thanks. I mean, in this opening report, um, part, I just hope to sort of provide the motivation behind how the report was, uh, where well, the report was written and sort of set the scene and just outline some of the statistics, you know, which was quite stark. And I'm sure that many of the attendees have uh, 
have uh, seen in the seen in the news. So I mean, obviously, the reason for this report is the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic population have been severely uh, disproportionately affected during this crisis. I mean, the unfortunate thing about this crisis, it's not the only area within society where Black, Asian, and minority ethnic um, population have been treated wrongly. Um, this crisis is only laid bare, um, uh, not only laid bare, but it sort of exas exacerbated the structural racism that exist um, to the point where it's actually costed lives. Um, you know, we see that uh, even though 40% of the UK population are from a black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, population, 35% of hospital admissions uh, have seen the most severe case and have seen, um, um, have been from people from that population, which is the uh, amount of severe cases. So the government obviously commissioned the report on the disparities uh, in the risks and outcomes of COVID-19 uh, via Public Health England, with actually the government having to embarrassingly hold that back in reports of fears of causing, uh, causing uh, just, just justified anger. So the reports obviously outline traits that contribute uh, to, the, to the higher risks of COVID-19. These include uh, lower socioeconomic status, uh, presence of certain health conditions, and uh, both of which actually uh, disproportionately affect uh, black and Asian and minority ethnic uh, population have to uh, face the bigger brunt of it. In combination with that report, there was a, another ONS um, publication which both showed scary risks and in the increased uh, risks of death. For instance, the risk of death for COVID-19 infections is around four times higher around, um, among black people from Afro-Caribbean ancestries, uh, two times higher uh, in South, uh, South Asian, um, ancestry men, uh, but that's when you compare that to British men of European ancestry. Even accounting for age, uh, sex, deprivation, UK region, people of Bangladeshi ancestry have a twofold increase in the risk of death relative to the UK uh, white population. And people in other black, Asian or minority ethnic uh, groups showing uh, an increased risk uh, between around about 10% and 50%. Um, we see um, income poverty rates varying substantially between ethnic groups in the United Kingdom in combination with area. Additionally, for people who are white, income poverty is similar uh, across all areas of the country, whereas actually for people in minority ethnic groups, the rates are much higher in inner city London, uh, north of England and the Midlands. And these are actually the regions which are the most deprived in the UK. And so as a whole, people in these areas are dying of COVID-19 at double the rate uh, compared to the more affluent areas. And uh, before we continue, a point I must make um, is that the UK Black, Asian and minority ethnic population include a wide range of ethnicities. So who actually don't share any sort of common uh, ancestors. And therefore it, it's, it would be wrong to actually say that because they share a sort of common genetic background, we can therefore sort of plaster that as being the sort of uh, uh, reason why there's increased risks. That is just frankly wrong. There is some merit and it's discussed in the report about the uh, vitamin D deficiency, which can affect the immune system, which in effect can obviously increase risk. But we must remain, to we must remain total in the fact that structural racism uh, has been the you know, most hard hitting to the black, uh, Asian and minority ethnic population during this crisis. I mean, even among NHS staff, a workforce which uh, we applaud every Thursday, black, Asian and minority ethnic death rate is apparent across all grades of NHS staff. An earlier report uh, survey showed 50% of respondents uh, who are of a survey to black, Asian and minority ethnic staff felt discrimination actually played a part in that higher death toll, uh, which even the survey actually included accounts of racism. 53% of respondents saying they did not even feel comfortable raising such concerns, which to be quite honest with you is actually heartbreaking. Now, unfortunately, the report from Public Health England had obviously no uh, recommendations and left a lot of unanswered questions. But in this report, we do hope that we can at least answer some of those questions, put forward hypotheses that can be quickly tested and suggest interventions and policy changes to rapidly improve the situation. Because I don't think anyone in this call or any, well, I hope anyone in the wider, in wider society would want to live in a society which shows such shocking statistics. Thank you for that, Mohammed. Um, it was, it's a really great introduction and obviously a, a very difficult topic and a very difficult situation, but we're hoping to to do our part in, in, in uh, rectifying those problems that we, that we can. Um, so to move on to the next section, Adam is gonna talk through this, but just to be clear, it's obviously the work of many different people. So especially Olga, um, Jose, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. So if you do have particular questions on specific topics in the question and answer at the end, we might point you in the direction of, of someone who contributed specifically on that topic. But Adam is gonna talk us through 
uh, section two, which is on external factors, i.e. things about the wider society and structural racism that have played a role in this pandemic. Yeah, thanks, Ben, and, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, just to say there, um, as Ben was saying, m my role was in kind of coordinating this section, um, but we had a lot of input from several people. Lucy also was a big, big input here, so thank you, Lucy. Um, yeah, just to touch on before we go into the external factors themselves, the way we chose to divide um, different sections of this report, this was kind of a challenge, um, working out exactly how we're going to structure the thing but we ultimately went to de define it by internal and external factors. Now this is a somewhat arbitrary definition, um, but broadly these are th things that are it, yeah, internal or external, I suppose. But it's worth noting that there is likely to be some crossover between these. You can't really treat them in isolation. Um, and there are lots of things. And just to reiterate what Ben was saying at the start, you know, we have, absolutely no intention here of blaming black, Asian and minority ethnic people in any way for any of these particular factors. Um, but with that said, we'll, we'll talk about the different issues going on here. So I think we, we structured the external stru factors in kind of two primary subsections, um, looking at health inequality for BAME people uh, and also structural racism. Uh, a lot of this section, section was based on some of the sections in the Public Health England, England report that uh, Murad, you alluded to uh, during the introduction. Um, but we've kind of tried to touch on some of the things that they talked about in the Public Health England report and reply, uh, uh, apply a, a little more of our scientific background to it. So um, if you just scroll down a little bit. Uh, first thing we've talked about there is, is health inequality and, you know, we, there's lots of evidence to say that inequality is widespread in the BAME communities. Um, yeah, we, there's particular diseases that are more uh, prevalent in certain groups than others, um, and there are lots of poorer outcomes in terms of health uh, as, a, as a result of these diseases from BAME communities. Um, we also noted particularly that you know, six out of every 10 health workers that has died from COVID-19 are from BAME backgrounds, which I think given the makeup um, in terms of percentages of different backgrounds in our country is pretty, pretty stark um, as a result and pretty horrific. Um, one of the things we talked about briefly there is geography. So um, I think everybody will be aware of this, but COVID-19 has been felt more in certain areas than others. And often there's a correlation between the areas where there's large BAME populations um, and different communities compared to uh, other areas. Um, if you just scroll down to occupation, yeah, so it's definitely worth remembering that there's quite a lot of evidence that says that not all occupations are, are similarly affected by COVID-19 and there's a fair amount of um, evidence that says that a lot of the occupations that are more common more commonly held by uh, people from BAME backgrounds are often those areas where um, occupations are being more heavily affected by COVID-19. So um, things that, that have been particularly identified are you know, road transport drivers, caring personal services, elementary security operations, construction building, sales assistants and retail generally. And there is a higher proportion um, in those particular areas of people from BAME backgrounds. So, you know, there's a, there's a clear occupational correlation there as well. Um, if we scroll down just a little bit further, uh, moving on to education, um, there's a fair bit of literature out there that suggests that older people and those with learning disabilities, children and young people, migrants, and of course, BAME people uh, have a lower health literacy. This is a really interesting thing that was quite prevalent. Um, we're talking about health literacy here being the de degree to which an individual can obtain, process and understand basic health information and services. Uh, but this also refers to the confidence and the ability to make informed decisions that contribute to managing and improving their own health. Um, and there's evidence out there to suggest that people from BAME backgrounds, um, for whatever reason, uh, seem to have somewhat lower health literacy, um, which in turn has compounding the effects uh, of, of COVID-19 and what 
is behind this is, is not well known. Um, but this has clearly exacerbated the problem. Um, if we move on to testing next, um, the government thus far, as we know here, the government's five pillar testing strategy hasn't made any reference um, to the increased risk that we noted throughout this report to BAME people. Um, and that widespread community testing is hard to get a true picture of the risks and impacts of the disease, um, particularly within vulnerable groups. I think this has been a, a general issue is that there's not enough emphasis been placed on people that are particularly vulnerable in the testing strategy. Um, I think one of the things that we noted throughout this piece of research was that there was generally a lack of research that had been done in these areas. There hasn't been very much focus in a lot of the research uh, placed on vulnerable groups and particularly on BME people. Um, and I think that feeds into our section on structural racism, which we've got next. Um, so we're, we're referring here obviously to the structural racism, which is the inequitable status between individuals of different ethnic groups, um, resulting in differential access to goods and services. And I think, you know, if anything that's occurred in the last few days and last couple of weeks in the news cycle, it is huge amounts of evidence towards the presence of structural racism. Um, and there is a lot of scientific evidence that suggests that, uh, that this is the case as well. Um, so if we just scroll down a little bit further, um, I'm talking about healthcare in terms of structural racism. I think this was a really shocking finding. Um, we found that the, there's some research that suggests that BME people are reported to be less likely to use GP services and generally more likely to report poor general health um, than the white British population. So th there is, there is a, a fundamental structural discrepancy that is working against BME people here, which I think was really quite shocking when I read through this myself. Um, we've got people from Bangladesh and Black Caribbean and other black backgrounds were particularly dissatisfied with hospital services in a recent survey. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. You know, the implication there is that BME people are not receiving treatment in hospitals that is as adequate as white people. Um, again, this paper by Evandru et al. It was a really interesting read uh, about some of these particular issues. If we continue scrolling. Um, yeah, housing, and this, this is similar to the geography that we talked about earlier in the section. Um, there's qu quite clear evidence that socioeconomic status has a significant influence on health. And therefore it's important to recognize that socioeconomic disadvantage is often linked to structural racism. It's fairly clear in the literature that BAME people often live in communities that are more densely packed, um, densely pop populated urban areas, and often have lower household incomes um, and lower average incomes, which is very clear in, in the government's own evidence. And these factors, dense population, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to see that dense population is something that has caused a significant amount of um, harm as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, that's how housing affects it. We could keep scrolling. Um, policing, I think this is obviously extremely poignant at the moment with the death of George Floyd recently. Um, we've seen a lot of news coming out of the United States, but there's obviously plenty, also plenty of evidence in the UK to show that we are not free of the same issues that they see in the US. Um, in the UK, black people were over three times likely to be arrested as white people. So th there's very, very clear evidence, I think, that structural racism exists in the policing system. Um, I think lots of people on, on this call will be very aware, well aware of that from the past weeks and, and years and months and decades, if not centuries. Um, in terms of language and communication, you know, there's been several studies that have shown that language barriers are significant factor in the quality and speed and access to the method of treatment of immigrant patients. Um, compared to some other people, our translation services are better, but we did note that it's essential that translation interpretation services function effectively 
in order to minimize any extra medical factors that could hinder diagnosis, treatment and recovery. Um, and there's lots of information that while we may be better than some other countries, um, there is always improvement that can be made in terms of improving the language barriers that prevent people accessing healthcare. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the external factors. So I'll hand back to Ben to move on to the next speaker. Yeah, thank you so much, Alison. Um, Adam, so I'm now going to hand over to Alison to talk about possible internal factors. So again, to point out, this is very much an ongoing area of research. And we should be very clear that we're talking about, about science here. There's no role for, I think, what we would consider quite abhorrent views of just labeling all BAME populations which is genetically identical and more uh, predisposed. Um, Alison's the expert here and she'll, she'll talk us through the, the incredible genetic diversity in the BAME population in the UK, but why vitamin D is still potentially something that could play a role in why those communities are, are more strongly affected and also what we can do to, to evaluate whether that actually is the case or not. So Alison, I think you're muted, unfortunately. Have I, have I unmuted myself? Oh, good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. So we knew from countries ahead of us in the epidemic that there were clearly internal factors that increased the risk of getting a serious infection or, or even death. Um, and these included things like diabetes and obesity and heart and lung disease and chronic kidney disease. And we also know from, from our studies in the UK that these so-called comorbidities are much more prevalent in the UK BMA ME populations than they are in, in the rest of the population. And some of that is clearly socioeconomic. That must play a part. Um, but even after adjusting for the socioeconomic factors, it's clear that these, these are more prevalent among, among BAME populations, as is COVID-19 infection. Um, and having said, having said that, 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 I mean, one of the clear examples actually, or it, although anecdotal, is that there's a, a very high rate of deaths from in, of BAME doctors uh, in the NHS, it's over 90% of the, of the doctors who are not particularly considered uh, to be so socioeconomically deprived have been from BAME populations. So we can see that socioeconomics doesn't explain all of it, but genetics definitely doesn't explain it all either. Um, because as we've already said, the, the UK BAMA groups are, are genetically very diverse. They, they come from different regions of the world and, and they are, don't share common ancestors. So we can't have an encompassing genetic explanation. So that really led me to want to understand much more about the vitamin D hypothesis. If you could scroll up a bit, Ben. No, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Um, um, it has to be said that vitamin D as a, is very much a hypothesis, um, it's, it's not proven, um, but it's a compelling one and it's definitely worthy of a lot more research. So one of the things we know is that vitamin D levels are, or low vitamin D levels might be a common factor across many of the high risk groups including elderly people and BAME people. Um, and if you can move down to the graph that we've plotted, there, there have been five, at least five different studies looking at comparisons of, of vitamin D levels in different areas of the country in different populations. And we summarize them with the help of Jose, we, we've summarized those here. Um, and what you can see that the gray dotted line is the line uh, uh, below which you would be considered vitamin D deficient. And so a lot of the UK populations are vitamin D deficient. Um, and what is very apparent here is that the Asian population who are marked in red are often deficient all year round, not just in winter, but in summer as well. And the, there are not so many results on Afro-Caribbean populations but where we have them, they seem to be sitting intermediate between the Asian population and the UK white population. Um, what we do know is that there are 
multiple good studies that show that vitamin D in adequacy is helpful in reducing things like acute respiratory tract infections and diabetes severity. And we've also got evidence that people who are admitted to intensive care for their COVID-19 infections very often have low vitamin D levels. Um, so we don't have as yet studies that demonstrate that increasing your vitamin D is protective from either getting the infection or from, from death, but it's something that we really should look into. Um, and we will soon be, with the, the amount of data that we're generating, we will soon be in, in, in a position to establish if there is a causal link. Um, but in the meantime, what I'm keen to get over is that we really shouldn't miss the opportunity to encourage more people out into the sunlight during the summer because sunlight is the major source of vitamin D in, this, in, in, in Britain. It's not highly prevalent in our diets. Um, and there are a lot of people, particularly from the BAME population and, and from older populations or people with low mobility, who maybe haven't been getting out into the sunshine. They've often been discouraged from doing it due to the lockdown results. And that has probably meant that their vitamin D levels are even lower now than they might have been at the beginning of the epidemic. So if we can do things that encourage more people out into the sunshine, it won't do anyone any harm and it may well do a lot of people a lot of good. Thank you, Alison, um, for that. So the other section in internal factors um, was written by Rachel, and it's on comorbidities. Unfortunately, um, Rachel is somehow, a, well, fortunately, she's somehow an intensive care nurse in addition to writing reports for us. And I think she's still on shift, unless you're back with us, Rachel. No, um, so I think she's on a shift. So I won't try and talk through, through her sections, but just to say we do have um, a, a discussion of the role of other comorbidities in relation to COVID-19. So that is other risk factors which make you more likely to die or get severe COVID-19. And many of those are more common in BAME populations, or rather I should say in specific subsets of the BAME population. So those include uh, diabetes, hypertension, so high blood pressure, and um, obesity in certain parts of the population. So if you, if you do want more detail on there, you're, you're welcome to read it. If you have further questions, do, do write to us and we'll make sure they're passed on to uh, the people who wrote this section. And again, in terms of suggestions, we'll talk about that, but there clearly needs to be a more detailed understanding of how and why these comorbidities are affecting COVID-19. And it's likely those reasons may have some internal factors, but obviously uh, socioeconomic status, including deprivation, will play a role as well. So moving on, our, our, our de deviation from our usual tack for reports is that this time we've proposed definite policy suggestions. So we've split those into short term, medium term and long term. Short term being things that the Labour Party could lobby for tomorrow and I think would be sensible things for the government to adopt on an immediate basis. The medium term ones are things that we could think about over the scale of the pandemic and the longer term ones deal with some of the more structural issues that we've discussed. And obviously there are no quick or easy solutions there, but it absolutely should be Labour pushing at the forefront of them. So I'll take you through the short policy section and then Rasheen will take you through the medium policy one. So as mentioned earlier, there's no mention of BAME individuals or, or higher risk groups other than those by occupation in the government's testing strategy. So the pillar one testing covers sort of frontline healthcare workers. And we would argue that if BAME people are clearly at higher risk, perhaps the government should consider prioritizing them in devising testing and testing frequency plans. So obviously as the crisis goes on, it will be clear that some people have to be tested more frequently than others. And it might be pertinent to consider whether ethnicity should play a role in offering BAME workers more tests than their white counterparts. Secondly, we've seen many hospital trusts um, doing risk assessments on, on their BAME staff, so making sure that they're not placed into frontline roles in an unsafe manner. The government, should ah. consider, uh, the government should roll that out for all 
workers in our, in our opinion moving on to the fact that all shops um, will have the option to reopen in a few weeks it's important that BAME populations and BAME individuals do not feel that they're being disproportionately put at risk. Similarly that applies for shielding so as we've seen healthcare workers are disproportionately from black Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds and as we've seen from the context of intergenerational households and high population density, shielding can be more challenging in that context. So there is government advice on shielding in intergenerational households, but the government should consider whether it can better develop that policy, given that it seems to be considered by those groups to be insufficient at the current time. There's also evidence that education of healthcare professionals in the UK has focused predominantly on white patients and predominantly on white male patients and that's important because it can make it difficult to understand some of the way that symptoms present themselves on black asian and minority ethnic patients and thus it makes it more difficult to identify and treat them appropriately so for example um, specific ones that we were given by our, our colleagues working in intensive care were the difficulty of diagnosing cyanosis, so the bluing of extremities in response to oxygen deprivation on darker skin. And there have been studies that medical professionals are just not trained to recognize that in patients with darker skin. And also in, in diagnosing this new Kawasaki-related syndrome that appears to be occurring in some children, it's much easier to see on white skin tones and doctors have expressed concern that they haven't been adequately trained to diagnose it on darker skin tones. Again, this seems like something that should be relatively easy to fix through provision of urgent training. Furthermore, um, it, it's clear that intergenerational households are more common in BAME communities. And again, whilst not to blame BAME communities in any way, if you have, for example, healthcare workers isolating or, or, or in close proximity to older family members, there's clearly increased risks. The advice should be updated and the government should also undertake a more detailed study of how the disease spreads in such intergenerational households and explain how its models account for the fact that the traditional family unit is perhaps less likely to apply in a BAME context. Furthermore, as Alison has said, the government should ensure that the continued public health messaging to BAME communities is kept up. So making sure that people keep being encouraged to get out for exercise where they can and to get vitamin D from sunlight where they can. So those are both clearly uh, low risk but potentially quite effective treatments. And whilst we're not proposing a medical approach, we're not proposing this as an intervention, we suggest the government should, should discuss whether a precautionary approach would be pertinent here. That is, if there's uncertainty about whether any factor plays a role and the intervention would be very cheap and low risk, there may be some benefit in rolling it out anyhow, just in case it turns to be effective. Um, furthermore, we've obviously seen that racism has played a role both in determining how populations are affected by this disease and also in how likely they are to come forward for treatment. It's entirely possible that we'll see increased racism again against those of Chinese or East Asian background um, as reports into the origin of the virus become public and the government should take steps to counter that. Um, on the final items under the short-term policy, thankfully this appears to have been mostly resolved, but many British residents were stranded abroad during the early stages of the pandemic. And it appeared a large number of them were BAME individuals visiting family, for example, in the Indian subcontinent or Southeast Asia. Some of them may have um, suffered indirectly as well, for example, if they didn't have access to medication in that period, and the government should ensure that they're following up on said individuals to make sure they receive the support that they need. And finally, in terms of general communication and messaging, obviously for those who have a reduced English comprehension for any reason, be that uh, young age, old age, or English as a second language, it may be more difficult for these individuals to comply with public health messaging because they don't understand exactly what they're being asked to do. And there is some advice available in multiple languages, but the government should urgently consider what effect and what uptake these resources are having because it appears there's very little work that's been done on how effective this communication in multiple languages is within the UK context. So for the next section I'm going to hand over to Roisin to talk through. Hello, um, so yeah the first kind of point would be uh, around air pollution. 
So we know that air pollution disproportionately affects inner cities um, and areas without access to greener, cleaner spaces. Um, and as we've kind of already heard earlier, um, BAME households are more likely to live in these areas um, and in unsuitable housing. Um, there's more detail for this in the report, obviously, um, and can be more detail can be seen in the um, Scientists for Labour report on air pollution between the links. But something needs looking into if we can improve the quality of air, then that may have um, a, an effect on the BAME communities uh, in regard to COVID. Um, as kind of touching and linked to the short term um, policy idea we had around language, it's very evident that language barriers can have a severe uh, effect on quality and speed, um, access to a method of treatment. So um, although there's uh, some advice out there already uh, for health professionals on how better to communicate with those whose, whose English uh, may not be proficient, they're not of a high enough standard for use in emergency situations. And obviously in an emergency situation, it's essential that clear communication um, is possible. So it's vital that the government looks to improve in interpretation and translation services in frontline environments. And so to ensure that kind of sufficient patient clinician communication and uh, a big factor in this is it shouldn't vary between trusts. At the moment, we see kind of different standards from trust to trust, some trusts are providing iPads with translation services, some are leaving nurses and doctors with Google Translate and, and that's the best you can get. So we need to ensure kind of a level of parity um, among trusts. Uh, just again to kind of draw on what Ben had already said, we need to ensure that all public health messaging is provided in a wide range of languages so that we can get the message out there to, to everyone within the populace. Uh, if you could scroll. So the next with funding calls to understand the issues basically discussed in the report. You can't quickly get all the research, but by pumping the funding into these areas that are specifically focused upon BAME individuals and BAME communities in COVID-19, um, that can, can obviously lead to, to solutions. And so we should be pushing for um, research funding to be targeted uh, at the issues discussed in the report. Um, the other thing, financial security and no recourse to public funds. So uh, this really needs to be considered. Uh, the effects of uh, no recourse to public funds and other limitations on support services and, and the effects that's having on BAME communities in a disproportionate manner. So if, if it's looking at temporary easing of controls so that communities have these communities have access to these resources as anyone else uh, would. Um, and finally, uh, just a point around the prison population. So BAME individuals make up 13% of, um, of the UK population but the prison statistics show that in 2018, 27% of the uh, prison population identified as being from an ethnic minority. So clearly that, that's substantial. Um, so given the increased um, rate of uh, the increased risk of COVID-19 in prisons that we saw early on, um, we really need to kind of be pushing the, the government to provide an update on the ongoing precautions for prisoners, um, including their early release po uh, policy. There also need to be further te steps taken to protect the prison population due to the uh, disproportionate number of BAME individuals within the prison system and um, also um, for staff who work in prisons who, again, are disproportionately BAME. Perfect, thank you. So in terms of longer term policy, which is the last section that we'll talk through, um, I'm going to hand over to, to Nacho for this bit. And again, please see the appendix if you want more details on the statistics. These are not necessarily fully developed policy ideas, but they touch on some of the key things that we should be considering in this context. Um, over to you, Nacho. Yeah, perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, these, as Ben has explained before, are more um, uh, are measures that we should take over the next decade, years and decades. Uh, first, we have to look at the housing inequality. Uh, we know that uh, high urban environments don't uh, does, don't mean that the COVID outbreaks uh, become uncontrolled, as we've seen in East Asia. But uh, but the housing inequality uh, could worsen and the impact of of, of epidemics. Uh, so the solution uh, policies that address that that issue. That related to that, uh, we need to look also into uh, how um, uh, 
um, tem um, temporary and stable accommodations uh, have uh, reduced uh, social distancing and thus uh, and thus um, enhance the spread of, of COVID. Uh, we need more accessible and um, better social housing. Uh, uh, there, as there are clear also racial divides the, the, uh, at the moment in the quality and availability of, of, of it. Uh, we also need to, to, to give housing to homeless people uh, in order to guarantee their shielding from the epidemic. There have been past uh, reports and there were, uh, there, were, uh, um, there were a study from 2012 alerting that in case of pandemic, the homeless population in London would be greatly affected, as we've seen this year. Um, next on, uh, we need to talk about uh, long-term poverty, and which is, of course, uh, re intrinsically related to our economic system. Uh, we know that uh, that Black, Bangladeshi, and Pakistani uh, and Pakistani Britons are overrepresented in in the poorest uh, wards in the country. So uh, we can link. Uh, we, uh, we we can tell a story of higher poverty around those communities and we know that uh, the posterity as, as, uh, as enacted in the past 10 years uh, has, uh, has worsened the, the, the daily life of, of, of all these people. Uh, and it also has likely uh, uh, made the impacts of COVID uh, much worse among, among those communities. Uh, so yeah, as the Labour Party, we should be looking at other economic, uh, other economic routes and other, and other economic proposals that, that, that guarantee that uh, that uh, that uh, things that we've seen uh, for the past ten years under this Conservative government don't don't become the norm. Um, we also need, uh, of course, uh, education uh, to um, on the general population, but especially among health workers. On several aspects, so we need to uh, we need to combat the, in, the intrinsic uh, systematic racism the, that affects uh, the British population. In in this case, uh, we know there we uh, we have uh, there are several reports that uh, was, it has been explained before that white and BAME uh, patients are treated differently, and that uh, sometimes white doctors can't. Uh, understand and, and or can't give uh, the an optimum treatment to to BAME uh, patients. We also need to look into comorbidities of of say uh, BAME patients. We don't. Um, it's uh, an area that is not well uh, explored. Uh, I'd say by the average GP. Um, Going back to more uh, to more social and economic factors, uh, we should uh, also. Uh, explore uh, the, the um, in ways of tackling uh, the low uh, how like um, the, the, how social mobility is more or less impossible for for those uh, trapped in lower skill or more manual roles who are also uh, disproportionately vain and who are who were very exposed to the pandemic as they are very normally uh, uh, roles fa facing the public. Uh, again, a similar situation with uh, with the economic uh, with the with economic policy. We need to ensure that uh, that social mobility uh, becomes um, uh, becomes some much easier in in the country, and that uh, and that uh, those who are uh, stuck in low paid jobs that um, are very insecure uh, can get out of can get out of those. And just to finish off. Um, uh, we need to we need to study how pillar four and five of testing can be can be uh, fine tuned to main communities. Uh, pillar four is the surveillance testing to learn more about the disease and to help developing new tests and treatments. And pillar five is uh, the diagnostics national effort to build a mass testing capacity at a completely new scale. Again, uh, without a main Focus um, with a main focus implementation of these measures. Uh, this strategy is not going to be uh, fully uh, fully successful. We believe. Perfect. Thank you, Nacho, for for that sum up. It's certainly a few longer term things to think about. Um, so for the next few minutes, uh, if if there are more questions, we could carry on a little bit before nine. But equally, if people need to dash. Please don't feel bad. 
Um, it'd be great if you can put your, your questions in the chat and then I'll direct them to whoever would be the most appropriate. Just in terms of one that I've seen a few people ask, um, where will the recording of this and the report be posted? We'll post the recording on our YouTube channel and we'll post the report on our website. So that's scientistsforlabor.org.uk. Maybe you could type it in the chat, Joe. And if you'd like, you can also sign up on our website to get emails when new reports are released so you don't have to look for them every time. Uh, so the first question that I, I see in there, um, maybe Alison, you'd be able to answer this on the how, how you balance the need to get exposure to vitamin D with the risks of skin cancer. I think you're muted, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> back now um <laughs> i'm struggling with this one because i come from a cancer genetics background um and what i suspect is there's been a strong emphasis on reducing sun exposure to protect white people from skin cancer it's not nearly such an issue if you're from a bma background um, and even if you're very pale skinned, spending 20 minutes a day in the UK in full sun is unlikely to do you any harm. So I think there's been an emphasis that, it, not wanting to say it's racist, but it has, has overemphasized the dangers for one group of the UK population and perhaps underestimated it for other people. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Alison. So I see a question now. Was any research done into the working conditions for senior NHS practitioners working in high risk wards or longer hours to get jobs? Uh, Adam, do you recall anything or Rasheen from the papers we read about how the split in terms of uh, NHS workers and how they were dis disproportionately affected, whether so they were white or beige? Nothing immediately springs to mind um, in a study on that, that specific front. Um, it's possible I've just forgotten which particular sentence from the report that, that is from. So maybe double check the report when it comes out at nine o'clock. But we should disclaim, as with all of our reports, you know, we are a volunteer organisation um, doing this as and when we are available. And we don't claim to have an exhaustive cover of all of the available research. We've covered as much and everything that we were capable of finding um, in a relatively short period of time. But I don't want to say for sure that that piece of research doesn't exist, but I don't recall reading it myself. Cool. OK, um, thank you. So another question. Um, so for, from Tony Young, I guess, I guess related to Alison <laughs> to come back to you. Should the governments be emphasising the importance of taking vitamin D supplements. So I believe there are some statements on the NHS website about that at the moment. Could you maybe um, sum up what the current medical advice is for us, please? You want me again? So yes, there are recommendations on the NHS website, um, particularly during winter and particularly for certain groups who might be at risk. I think in general, I would like to see there being more research into how much value there is from taking supplements um, as as to whether actually how whether supplements are really a good way forward or and i guess my, my emphasis is that it's summer now and so long as the sun shines that one's free it's not medical and most people find it very pleasant um, so an, an offer of a contribution, which I think would be very welcome. So Emma, who introduced our report on schools, I think would be keen to hear from, from your perspective as, as a counsellor, uh, how you feel that health inequality has manifested in, uh, in, in, in the constituents that you, you represent and the research that you're doing on that. Um, yes, indeed. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I'm doing some, um, I'm, I'm shielded at the moment because I'm recovering from cancer, as you may know, but um, um, a perfect lockdown project. I'm doing some work on inequalities 
um, in Kensington and Chelsea, and that's actually, you know, obviously I, I compare it with London and the rest of the country. Um, um, and this is a bit of an update of some work I did about five years ago, um, where one of our neighbourhoods um, was the joint poorest ward in the whole of London. Um, it's actually now the second poorest ward in London, but the first poorest is very, very poor, and our, poor, our second poorest ward has got poorer. So I'm doing very, very fine-grained work on this, um, looking at everything, uh, educational attainment, health deprivation, all the um, um, indices of multiple deprivation. It's probably going to come out in October. I'm very happy to share it with you because um, uh, apart from anything else, I said it is very fine grained looking at lots of different issues, um, I, um, including take up of vaccinations, dental health, infant mortality, which is one of the worst in the country in Kensington, Chelsea, which is very strange. Um, it's a kind of, um, it's a baseline uh, for now. Um, and um, it's uh, which I can compare in a year's time um, to see, you know, what, what, what the after effects are post COVID uh, and during recession. And I think it'll be very interesting. And I'm finding, as you're finding, that there's very little. If you look at the Office of National Statistics, there's not enough um, on looking at, at um, different ethnicities, uh, which in a constituency, well, a borough like Kensington, Chelsea. Um, where we are more than half non-white here um, in across the constituency it's ridiculous not having that information so I'm going to keep on digging um, and um, I, I'm, I'll be sharing that with you it'll come out in autumn I don't think there's any point putting it out in um, in the summer and I hope Sina Lari is going to be helping me because he's got a bit of a break coming up to help me with all my graphs and whatnot so I just wanted to share that with you um, um, and uh, I think it's going to be um, quite valuable um, looking into the fi very fine-grained um, information about inequalities. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So a question from Kevin on schools reopening to a wider range of students and the guidance regarding BAME staff and the higher risk they face. I guess that applies to anyone with a, with a high risk or shielding condition. This was raised as something in our schools report of two weeks ago, um, which we of course just actually discussed with Emma it was entirely unclear to us that adequate safeguards had been put in place for high-risk staff. Um, that may have changed in the intervening time, but we, I certainly haven't seen any update of that. So if, if anyone else who's on this call um, has seen some guidance on, on what high-risk slash shielding or BAME staff should be doing in the context of schools, or, or indeed for, for pupils as well, um, I think we'd be glad to hear that and look at it. Um, so then a comment on, on PPE, that's actually a, a really valuable one about um, PPE and the equalities impact. I think that's probably something that we, we hadn't thought of, uh, but it's one to include in our report to ensure that the PPE supply is adequate, which, which is mentioned, and equitable, but also to make sure um, that the PPE provided is, is suitable for everyone rather than just being, being there. Um, so a question about housing, multi-generational occupation, are those proven links? Um, Sina, do you maybe want to, to come in on that? Or even Murad, I guess you might have some thoughts on whether there is a, a definite link between structural inequality, housing and, um, and, and health. Well, I think you're muted, unfortunately. No, I, I, I'm, I'm firstly, thank you to all of you for putting this report together. Um, and as, as Emma mentioned, I, I'm, I serve with Emma as a councillor in Goreborn in North Kensington. And um, we have a lot of experience dealing in what is the joint poorest ward, now the second poorest ward in London. And I mean, it's an issue facing inner cities in general, not just in London, but throughout the UK. Overcrowding, um, transient, temporary accommodation, um, particularly affecting ethnic minority people, it, it, it does exacerbate this crisis. And that's just the fact. Um, there is too little um, statistic published, as I mentioned, for us to delve into by the government. They haven't released what we need um, necessarily to put all this together. But from what we see on the ground, yes, the, 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 the temporary accommodation, overcrowding, um, the fact that um, the housing is not fit for the needs of those who live in it, issues we faced for years and years, uh, have compounded this issue. 
Thank you. Um, Murad, would you have any, any other takes on that? I guess you probably had quite a lot of oversight. Um, just need to unmute yourself, I think. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. That if you look at the figures for the London boroughs, um, it's boroughs like Harrow, Brent, Newham, uh, which have the highest levels of fatalities. Um, of and, uh, and they are substantially BME uh, community-based local authorities. I.e., uh, I think in Harrow it's, it's actually over fifty percent, and also probably in Brent now. Um, when when you look at the borough that I'm in, the city of Westminster, it's uh, a lot less lowered down with the fatalities. But even then, that there are certain patterns. In a ward like the one I live in, we've had about thirteen fatalities, and it's the most probably it's one of the most densely packed. Uh, wards in in London. Uh, by that I mean population over square square area. And I think there's no doubt a uh, relationship between space and open space um, available, um, which uh, which influences the, the the extent to which the virus can move around. Um, unfortunately, during most of the uh, the the lockdown we've had in my local ward. Uh, the, the, the one, one of the few local parks we've had has been closed. So even if people wanted to go out and get a bit of sun, it's just not been possible. Uh, and it sounds to me from what your report is suggesting, um, sitting at home has, has pro could well have exacerbated problems more so than we realise. And I, I, I think that, the, that that needs to be looked in very, very carefully with the, the vitamin uh, D deficiency. And uh, I trust um, some of our uh, health experts take that on board uh, as well as um, those in, in, in local authorities. I think it suggests to me we need to be less densely packed and have more green spaces in our future developments. Um, that's, that's the message I'm getting and I, I trust uh, we're all figuring, figuring that out anyway. Yeah, thank you. Um, you're also all, of course, welcome to go onto our website to look at our report on, on air pollution, which is obviously a, an issue related to both green spaces and housing density and the links that that has to COVID-19. Uh, we've just about finished up our hour, so I'd like to hand over now to, to Rupa Huck, uh, MP, who will talk us a little bit through, if, if you could, Rupa, the, the strategy in terms of, of the Labour Party, if, if, you, if you could on that, or, or what this report and this con its context mean to a policymaker. Yeah, thanks very much, Ben, and thank you for all the work Labour scientists are doing um, throughout this. So Ben knows I've been confiding in him through this pandemic. There is nothing like a global pandemic to make decisions happen very quickly. It can be a wake-up call for lots of reasons. So twice recently, when I had to go on TV, I sort of um, referred to your stuff. Um, so the most recent time was actually the odious Piers Morgan to talk about the PHE report. I think because I am of Bangladeshi origin, and that is the category, the category most likely to um, experience fatalities. And actually, I think you, I probably didn't tell you, Ben, but the other time before that was the confused subliminal lockdown unwinding messages mm. uh, the day that Boris Johnson went on TV I had to do another one after that and I looked at your briefing from that day it was very comprehensive because it pointed out that this five-stage plan uh, it didn't sort of say what the levels of measurement were between the, the different ones and how we would start unwinding um, so I mean, what it looks like from an MP's point of view, and it's really good to see Emma. Can I say, I miss you, Emma, come back. <laughs> Hopefully it's just a temporary aberration that you're not in here because yeah, we all really miss you. And it, it's brilliant to see you on this call. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure every elected representative, the councillors on the call as well have found our inboxes have gone crazy because there's a new way of doing everything, whether you're moving house, taking exams, we've had emails from people stranded abroad um, that sort of went away in February, March, whenever, before all this, and now are finding it impossible to get home. A lot of them we have got back, some people still not quite there. Um, so um, what I have found, and as a BME person myself, is I have a lot of high level conversations that I didn't have before all this. So certainly during our Easter recess, there was a daily call with the cabinet office so it felt like we were talking to people at the very highest level and able to influence things. 
Um, and at that point, because again, you know, Harold Wilson said a week is a long time in politics. A day is a long time in coronavirus. So we've got used to this new rhythm of doing things that there's this daily press conference now. I know they've ditched it for the weekends because the viewing figures were bad, apparently. But um, and some some aspects of those have gone as well. The COVID Olympics, the, it was interesting to hear Murad comparing the London boroughs. That's sort of not as prevalent as it was in the beginning. It used to be quite out there at the start. The Evening Standard would have a table. And the global death toll as well was in the press conference. That's gone. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess the takeaway from all this is ethnic minorities are a very broad category. Um, and um, yeah, so things have changed within this. On the PPE, arg PPE argument, it used to be um, that there's not enough supply. I think in Ealing, we're supposed to be quite well supplied. But this week I had a conversation. So again, I'm getting these high level things with uh, different ministers. My council leader, I speak to much more than I ever did. Head of schools at Ealing, I spoke to today. We had a, a London MP's call with Sadiq Khan. So I think the term ethnic minority is very broad and there seems to be two sets of explanations. You know, it's almost the nature nurture thing. So there's the race and class ones and then there's the genetic predisposition ones that almost feel like people are saying it's all their fault. They don't get vitamin D or whatever. So in fact, Ben, when we last spoke, you mentioned it was an interesting argument that vitamin D, I said, hang on, that's the sunshine one. And you said, yeah, it can be if people don't expose their skin to the sun, if they're in a hijab, they're not getting it. And I thought, I'm not going to say that because then it will be misquoted and someone will. So th there's a whole load of interesting things that have come out of that. So the PPE argument, as I say, used to be that the supply, and it's still not well catered for everywhere, but the conversation I had with Ealing Hospital this week was that what is coming through doesn't fit um, sort of um, Far Eastern nurses' head shapes. Um, and there's been a, a cat, uh, there's, um, so Filipino people like that sort of thing, they've got slightly different, I don't know, apparently bone structure. And I also heard, uh, sorry, there's also Caroline Criado Perez has done a campaign that it's all based on men's sort of dimensions and it's not suitable for women. Um, the Sadiq Khan conversation we had today, and, and again, these structural inequalities, so the PHE report came out and the R word, the R rate missing from that was racism, structural deep-seated inequalities. Um, and we've talked about it here, overcrowded housing, multi-generational households, those kind of things. Uh, so yeah, racism has been missing from quite a lot of this. And when you get the BMGA, it had a editorial uh, the other week saying it's time to combat racism. So that's the BMJ, not socialist worker. I think it's been said to me anecdotally by doctors I've spoken to that BME doctors are, are rostered for, you know, poor, you know, un un unsociable hours shifts when mistakes are made, that kind of thing. They get all the rubbishy. So the Sadiq Khan conversation, he was saying that everyone in City Hall well, now is having a risk assessment. Things like, I mean, I'm on a London bus, as you can see. Um, so things like London bus drivers, I did a bit around them. They are they are dying at a faster rate than, I think you're more likely to die as a London bus driver than an NHS frontline worker, because these buses are sort of like Petri dishes. They leave once a day from the garage and then people touch all the poles and all the bits. Since then, what we heard today is that there's a super cleaning, deep clean regime and that they are super protected, but not the ones who are on zero hours contracts. So again, all these things sort of collide on different levels. Um, the Ealing schools are largely going back on the 15th, but the letter sent to every parent, and I'm a parent as well, in the borough said that we don't want to rush opening these because we've got large numbers of BME staff, students and uh, multi-generational households and that actually annoyed some people and the head of school said if we hadn't alluded to it then it would have annoyed people as well you're darned if you do you're darned if you if you don't um so yeah i mean we know all of this already that sort of a lot of bme people are people are, are people that are exposed on the front line not just in the nhs but hospital cleaners porters um posties Uber drivers, uh, warehousing, sort of all of these things, uh, which which adds to this. 
Um, but yeah, it does feel it's the poorest and most exploited that are at the sharp end of this, and that's a lot of BME people. Sorry, I'm talking a lot, and I think you probably know all this anyway. <laughs> no, that's all right. Thank you, Rupa. Um, it's really useful to get your perspective on that and to compare that with, with Murada and Sina and Emma and others. So I think we'll, we'll finish it up there. Joe's just put a link to the report in the chat. But again, as I said, you can go on our website and find it at any time. Um, if you do want to, to know more, you're welcome to sign up to our mailing list or even better sign up to be a member. It's between zero and 10 pounds, depending on which category of membership you want to choose. And we'll obviously be carrying on with, with our work through the rest of the pandemic and over the summer. And we're going to try refocusing some of it as well to do more in-depth pieces looking at particular issues like this. So by all means, regardless of how much time you have, if you're able to help us out, please do please do join up and, and, and sign up to help. It would be great to have you. And uh, you can do that on our website or you can just get in contact with us. So without further ado, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to all of our volunteers for writing this report. Um, you know, Alison, great work. And we turn this around in a matter of a week or so. So, so well done, team. Yeah. Well done. All right. Um, so let's let's leave it there. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Thursday evening. Thank you, Roger. Well done.